Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood Podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on the John Campia YouTube channel. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? of our current age is authenticity and it's so true Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi and cinema, your evangelist of the imagination, and of course, the maybe never to be defined existential Mr. Rogers. That's right. Moi. Robert Meyer Burnett and I'm Rob casting you, you, you Imagination Connoisseurs, you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity, coming at you from the Rob Observatory for Rob Observations, episode number 900. And 44. That's right. I want to talk filmmaking tonight. You know, a lot of people always say that, hey, I really like listening to you talk about filmmaking. And uh, I wanted to talk about uh, an idea uh, that began as a critical observation by the French. And uh, it sort of carried over to the modern day that I tend to believe in. And it is it is a school of thought <clears throat> called the auteur theory. Auteur meaning the French word for author. Simple as that. Is the director the author of a film? Now, a motion picture is by definition a massively collaborative effort with hundreds if not thousands of people now in the day of CG artists working around the world. Literally, look at the end credits of a Marvel movie. Look at how many thousands of people work on a film. So how can it possibly be that the director is the auteur, the author of a film? I mean, wouldn't your normal inclination be that a screenwriter is the author of a movie? Well, the problem with that is a screenplay is just that. It's a screenplay. It's words on paper. It's not a movie. It's the blueprint of a movie. And uh, in my estimation, you can't make a good movie without a good screenplay. Because everything begins on the page. But you could take a screenplay and you could give it to 20 different people. And they would all deliver very different films from one another. So the question remains, who is the author of the film? I am a proponent of the auteur theory. Because on a movie set, everything that everybody else is doing, the costume designers will pass the costumes in front of the director. Does this fit your vision for the film? The cinematographer and the director must be in sync, simpatico, and how they're going to film the movie. What are they going to film the movie on? What format are they going to use? Are they going to use go back and still use actual photochemical film, exposed film, or are they going to shoot digitally? And if they're going to shoot digitally or on film, what format are they going to use? Are they going to shoot it? 
like a throwback, like Alexander Payne's The Holdovers? Are they going to shoot it in IMAX, like much of Dune 2? Or are they going to shoot it in widescreen, the way we enjoyed our Panavision widescreen films of the 1980s? Most of the large tentpole movies were, in fact, 235 to 1, or now in 4K, 239 to 1, so to speak, if that's what you want to call it. I mean, that's what you would call it, because that's what it is. So, uh, for me, the director, a good director, is definitely the auteur of a film, because all a good director has a vision. And I would like to try a thought experiment before I dive into tonight's articles. And by the way, the articles that I am going to read are in the description below, right uh, below or above the tip link. If you want to send in a tip and participate, you can do that, or just send in a super chat if you want to do that too. Um... I'll give you a thought experiment. Let's say a screenwriter gives you, you are the director of a movie. And I always say this when I've, I've lectured at classes, film classes or storytelling classes, but say you get the pages of a scene that is set at a restaurant with two people talking to each other. That's the scene. Might go on for a number of pages. It might be, you know, almost 10 minutes long, like the opening of the masterful The Social Network, written by Aaron Sorkin and directed by David Fincher. So let's say you are given a scene and you're going to shoot two people sitting across, or maybe they're not sitting across from each other, but the scene is two people are talking at a restaurant. That's the scene. It might be the most brilliantly written dialogue you've ever read in your life, but they're still sitting at a restaurant and they're talking. I would ask you, how do you shoot it? Think about that. How are you going to shoot it? Now, we, a movie, so you could shoot it a number of ways uh, based on, for instance, a lot of what you have to do is take into consideration how much time do you have to shoot the scene. Let's say the scene's a fairly lengthy dialogue sequence and it goes on for, say, five pages. Now, you could just set up a camera on sticks and shoot the conversation in one shot. The thing is, cinema tends to lull us to sleep if all you're looking at is a single shot. We're expecting more. The language of cinema, it's just like if I'm talking to you right now, I can do different things with my voice and I can make you feel, hey, how you doing? It's I'm here, I'm Crazy Eddie, and I'm here to sell you uh, TV. Or I can speak like this. Hi, I'm Crazy Eddie, and I'm here to sell you something you don't need. Different ways to speak. I can say the same words or not, but I can say the same words in very different ways. So a director would have to decide, huh, what kind of voice do you want me, the actor might say, to deliver the scene in? And, and the, the screenwriter might define it, that somebody is anxious, somebody's angry, somebody's mellow, somebody's stoned, whatever. They've, they've, the, the, the screenwriter has set that up in the pages, but it doesn't tell you how you shoot a scene. Like I said, one camera, or you have two people talking. Now you have to decide, okay, how many pieces of each shot is called coverage? It's a piece of coverage. So how do you cover the scene? How are you going to shoot the scene? Now, immediately you're dealing with regular cinematic language. There is what's called a master shot, which is a big wide shot of both both parties sitting at the table and you can shoot that master shot from a number of different, where do you want to put the master shot? Do you want it just to show the whole table? Do you want to see, you want to call it a dirty master, which means, don't get your head out of the gutter. It means that maybe you see people who are sitting around them, you see their heads in the foreground, perhaps. I don't know why you want to do that, but let's say you wanted to. Or you could be big, high, and wide, and you could show more of an establishing shot of the restaurant. And then when you got in closer, Let's say you wanted to create tension. So instead of just having a single shot on a 50-50 shot, maybe you have the camera on a dolly or a slider. And so the camera is going to be slowly creeping, slowly creeping. If you want to keep them, man, maybe it's subtle. Maybe you don't even know. Or you shoot more coverage. You've got your establishing. You've got your master. And now you want to shoot close-ups. So you've got a medium shot, maybe this, kind of where I'm at right now. 
or you shoot a close-up. And you can do what's called an over, maybe an over-the-shoulder shot on the other person. So their shot's clean. Or you can shoot what's called a dirty over, which means you're behind me and you catch a little bit of my shoulder and my head because maybe the way I'm reacting is something the director wants to convey. You don't, you're not on my face necessarily, but you want to hear somebody talking and maybe I, I, I'm like, oh, jeez. And you don't want to see my face on that particular moment. You just want to see me. Point is, there's many ways to shoot a scene of two people at a restaurant. And then, once you have all that coverage, you have to edit that scene. Now, an editor takes over in post. In my case, I edit my own stuff. But you give it to an editor, and an editor looks at all the coverage. And the director will pick. Let's say you did, you, you shoot the close-up on either side, by the way. You're doing this on either side, so you have to go around. So if you think about it, you could shoot a restaurant scene and say it's five pages long, and you might have 30 setups, 40 setups, a lot, depending on what kind of director you are, if you want to make it flashy, if you want to make it more languidly paced. Every time my philosophy of editorial is you only cut when all the information of a particular piece of coverage or shot is conveyed. So, Let's say you are focusing on the person listening to somebody talking and you want to see their reaction to what's being said. You stay on their reaction for as long as you need to to convey whatever you want to convey. They're annoyed, they're sad, they're shocked, gobsmacked, whatever. And when you've conveyed that to the audience, then you cut away. Because you've already given them information. You've told the audience everything. That individual shot has told the audience what they need to know about that reaction. Then you cut back because the person talking might notice how that person reacted. And that affects their own expression. Or the way they're telling whatever they're telling to that person. And that becomes an additional piece of information that you're giving the audience about how that conversation's going. So what makes you want to edit is when, at least this is my Rob Burnett philosophy of editorial, is every time you cut, it's because you've already given the audience the information they need in this shot, and you're cutting away to give the audience more information. Now, you don't always have to cut away. Maybe you want to stay on that person's face for a long time. Sometimes, in order to expedite the process, and this is if you're only working with one camera. Sometimes you'll be working with a lot more, like Michael Bay, his website, Shoot for the Edit. He'll set up eight cameras to shoot things. Now, he wants to get everything, and then as he, he'll tell you, he'll figure it out in the edit bay. He'll figure out, play with things, see what works. Now, if you don't have enough, obviously you have to have the money to burn. Every time you add a camera, you're adding not just one person, you're adding multiple people. You need somebody to pull focus you need somebody to load the camera if you're shooting on film there's so every time you add a new camera instead of a single camera there's an exponential cost associated with that but in the case of michael bay he's usually working on movies with big budgets so shooting with eight cameras or ten cameras is not out of the realm of possibility but then the director is not called upon to make decisions you're you're leaving it more loosey-goosey to give you those decisions in the edit bay that is one style of directing doesn't mean it's wrong, but that's not something that's on the page. A screenwriter, a good screenwriter, is not going to say, you're going to need 10 cameras. With 10 cameras, we're going to shoot this explosion. That's not what a good screenwriter does. That's what a director does. Now, a lot of people would say that what about all the other people that are on the set? Don't they contribute? Of course. Everybody contributes. But who's calling the shots about how to shoot a scene, what is in the scene, how the scene is going to look? Those are what a feature film director does, a good feature film director. The entirety of the production is filtered, starting with the screenplay that you need in the first place, but everything that's on that page is filtered through, I mean, everything. The director, everything in, in the, presc the proscenium is a stage word. It's everything that's on the stage, underneath the arch. That's the proscenium. I like to use the word proscenium, meaning the proscenium. It's not exactly the 
correct usage, but the proscenium of the frame, like everything that's in that frame, the mise-en-scene, as they say. So the director is responsible, usually through answering a million questions, for every single shot, everything that's in the frame, and how it's shot. Now, that's not to say that a director of photography, I mean, once you tell a director of photography what to do, um, you, you let that person and their team give you what you want. And, and that director of photography should already know what you want because you've discussed it with them, the director's discussed it, and you're getting exactly what you need. But that doesn't mean you don't want your director of photography to have his own ideas. Directors of photography know a lot more about lenses and especially light. Directors of photography know how to paint with light. They know how if you want to have a single light, you want to have a lot of light, you want to key fills, you want to have whatever kind of light you want, the director of photography, and, and the addition or subtraction of a light can make all the difference in the world. You know, and, and, and you want a good director wants the director of photography and indeed all the artists, the costume designers, the actors, to bring something that pluses, that adds to the film. But the director is the person on a motion picture that has the final say. There is nothing more damaging or toxic if the crew is listening to a second voice, the studio, a producer. But a director has to be strong. And I'll tell you something about directing a movie. If you ever find yourself directing a movie, a film director has what I like to say, you have until lunch on the first day to win your crew. Because the most important thing that a director can do is the crew, the crew is all there to serve the director. They're all waiting and they all they all know their jobs. As a matter of fact, they know their jobs probably a lot better than the director knows his or her or their job. They do. So they're waiting to service the director's vision, but the director has to convey that to the crew. So if a director comes in and someone says, your first AD or whatever, uh, because the first AD keeps the set, the, the, the first AD is like, the, uh, is like a stopwatch. He's, he's keeping the whole thing on, uh, on, on time and on budget and on schedule. So the first AD is going to ask the director and the DP, okay, what's the first setup? What's our first shot? If you're a good director, you don't do this. Well, um, what do you think? If that happens, you've lost your crew. And then you have to win them back. And sometimes you never win them back. But what you're telling the crew is, you haven't done your job. You haven't done the homework. And um, that's not to say that you can't, you know, take your time to think about what you're going to do. But you better fucking know what you're going to do because your crew depends on you to tell them what to do because the crew can't do shit unless the director knows what they're doing. Now, this is on a feature film. This is on good feature films. Is this the same as the director on a TV show? No, because the tens of thousands of things that you have to decide as a director on a film are already usually a director, unless you're directing the pilot of a TV show, the first episode, you that director gets to establish everything in the show, the look of the show, the feel of the show, the clothing, the casting. So those decisions have already been done. So if a TV director comes in, a TV director has already tens of thousands of questions answered for them. They can concentrate on just what I said. You're gonna shoot a conversation at a, at a restaurant, how are you going to do it? A TV director comes in and goes, okay, a TV director doesn't have to worry about the actors because they're already cast and they know their characters. They already know you don't have to worry about the clothes they're wearing. You don't have to worry about the way the episode's being shot. Now, a TV director can still pick those, can still pick where you want things to be shot, but they're working in a box that has already been previously defined by other people. That's why it's a lot easier for a, a TV director to... Uh, I mean, a, a feature director to go back to work on TV than it is for a TV director to go work on features. TV directors working on features, it's a whole different world, and you're being asked to do a lot of different things that you might not be ready for. Someone like Alan Taylor working on Thor The Dark World, for instance, probably a little overwhelming on that movie. But anyway, that's the difference. Uh, a theater director doesn't have to worry where the camera is. A theater director is worried about a lot of other things, but the proscenium is fixed. 
But a motion picture director, it's a singular job. But a lot of people would tell you, look, and to be fair, there's a lot of bad directors. There's a lot of bad directors that just don't know. And um, it's very apparent. And you never want to be those directors that the crew, you lose the crew. Because you have until lunch. I would dare say you have until the first setup. But I'll give you until lunch. Because sometimes things are slow to start. But I'll tell you something. By the time you're at setup three, four, or five, you know, if, if call time is 7 a.m. and you're going to get your first, first shot off at 8 or 7.45 or whatever, you better know what the hell you're doing. Anyway, where did all this, where did this idea come from? Well, it came from the French. And um, there's an article I wanted to read to talk about what the auteur theory, the director as author of the film, where it came from. And I have an article and this is from so the story goes dot com. Um, and it was written on well, it was posted on December 19th, 2022. The auteur theory is predicated on the concept that directors should be considered the real creators of the films they create. According to theorists, filmmakers have an authoritative voice and should have more say in the production of their films. Although Francois Truffaut first discussed the concept of auteurism in 1954, not many people now understand the term or the significance. According to the auteur theory, the director is the creator of a film, a critical notion in film studies. Francois Truffaut first introduced the word in relation to the work of French film critic André Bazin, and it has since mostly applied to European and Asian cinema. This article will provide an overview of classic auteur theory, its historical context, and the most current advancements related to auteur filmmakers. I just realized I'm going to plug my phone in if you'll indulge me as I do that. So I'm not going to break this down, but what is an auteur? When translated literally, the French word auteur means author in English. The term is typically applied to a film director with complete creative control over their work. Now, at the studio level, working on a $200 million movie, it's very difficult for a director to have retained complete creative control. Very few people do because there's so much money at stake. Um, but when you do, someone like Denis Villeneuve or Christopher Nolan, we have two great examples of what I believe to be auteurist cinema, which is Oppenheimer and Dune. Now, the difference there, too, is that Christopher Nolan wrote Oppenheimer based on the book Postmodern postmodern Prometheus, and John Spates and Denis Villeneuve himself wrote the script for Dune 2. So they're true auteurs in that they wrote the screenplays as well, or they co-wrote them. Francois Truffaut, building on the work of French film critic André Bazin, coined the term auteur theory to describe the argument that a film's director should be treated as the film's creator. There have been various criticisms and discussions on this concept over the years. While some argue that it should be applied to all art, Others argue that it should only be applied to visual arts like film. In his 1954 journal, Une, uh, I can't even, I'm going to massacre this, Une Certaine Tendance du Cinema Francais, I just killed that one, a certain trend in French cinema, Truffaut wrote as a critic for the prominent French publication Cahier du Cinema, Cinema Notebook, and introduced the concept. That was in 1954. Several of the new French directors Truffaut returned, referred to as auteurs were the subject of his writings. He contrasted auteurs with directors of commercial studio films whom he called merely metteurs en scène or stagers of a script created by someone else. Which is true, but I would dare say if somebody really knows what they're doing, they're not just stagers. According to Truffaut, the best films were created by directors and writers who could express their individuality via their work. Truffaut referred to this strategy as la politique des auteurs, the policy of the authors. The French New Wave filmmakers of that era that Truffaut coined la nouvelle, nouvelle vague were enthusiastic adopters of Truffaut's theories on film. Great band, by the way. Uh, they do 80s covers, and they're great. Uh, like Fr uh, the French film critic André Bazin, writing in the 1920s, is credited with introducing the concept of the auteur theory, the idea that a film's director, not the actors or writers, is the film's genuine creator. Auteur filmmaking emerged in the 1940s France as a way to make films quickly and cheaply. Although American film critic Andrew Saris is credited with coining the term auteur theory, the concept originated with the writings of André Bazin and Alexandra Astruc, 
who saw a connection between the post-war financial crisis and the desire to create more introspective films. Bazin developed the concept of the camera stylo, camera pen, approach by arguing that genuine film author is the director responsible for writing the idea, blocking the scenery, and communicating the overall message. Due to the work, volume, and limited access to funding in Europe's independent film scene, the auteur theory became widespread. Some names have become almost synonymous with auteur theory as it is taught in film schools, but this is not officially recognized. It's spot on in describing the unique styles employed by several directors. French filmmakers André Bazin and Alexandre, Alexandre, Alexandre Struck paved the way for the directors to have more creative freedom in their films. According to the French term auteur, auteur theory, the director is the picture's principal creative force. Boy, this, this, this uh, article is very repetitive. Truffaut used auteur theory to distinguish great filmmakers like John Ford and Alfred Hitchcock from mere craftsmen of Hollywood. Numerous directors and critics, including Martin Scorsese and Pauline Kael, have cited auteur theory as an inspiration. Stanley Kubrick, Steven Spielberg, and Quentin Tarantino have all been subjected to this theory's scrutiny. Films written and produced by auteurs ask profound questions about the nature of humanity and explored complex issues with complexity and expertise. Auteurs, in contrast to most filmmakers, who only adapt scripts created by others, are more likely to write their own screenplays or have a significant hand in the writing of their films. Affection for the auteur filmmakers and widespread application of the auteur idea did not really take off until the French New Wave of the 1950s. However, director names got bigger and the choice of film projects got more flexible. Francois Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard, two of the most influential directors, started developing views on the subject. Later, they caused a stir with sex, plot, and violence that shattered all the norms in low-budget, fast-cut films. Their guerrilla-style shooting in genuine locations, unknown actors, and creative license. Finance came from small donations, so they had only themselves to please in terms of substance. Young, aspiring auteurist filmmakers like Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, Brian De Palma, Peter Bogdanovich, William Friedkin, and many more watched as they stormed the gates and went around the studio system. They delved into more personal dark subjects, remaining true to their original vision, despite its shocking violence and otherworldliness. Because of the auteur theory's widespread popularity, more and more people demand that Hollywood make room for outsider visionaries. These days, the definition of an auteur is up for discussion and individual interpretation. Even though he didn't write most of his films, luminaries like Alfred Hitchcock are among the best since their work is instantly recognizable because of the consistent exploration of tension across most of their films. Contrarily, independent filmmaker Richard Linklater has written, directed, and produced every single one of his films, but he changes his approach for each one. Understanding where to draw the line in terms of involvement and what one's particular abilities are might be advantageous for auteur filmmakers. There are three components of the auteur theory. According to Andrew Saris, there are three primary components. Filmmakers who claim to be auteurs must be technically proficient masters of their medium. An auteur's involvement in the production of a film spans many departments, each of which requires expert execution. Compared to other technically proficient filmmakers, an auteur's distinct personality and style set them apart. Looking at a director's body of work as a whole often reveals recurring stylistic choices and thematic concerns. Films created by true auteurs may be easily identified as belonging to that person, which is a central component of the auteur theory. In stark contrast to the typical studio directors of the day who merely adapted scripts for the screen without questioning the originals or providing editorial input. These filmmakers are actively engaged with the material. In general, films directed by auteurs have more to say about human experience and have more depth of meaning. Artistic, artist-driven cinema, as, exposed, as, as opposed to the purely entertaining spectacles typically created by Hollywood studios, op often provide a window into the mind of the director. Now, here's the thing. This is pretty specific, but... I would go a little further that even like there were directors that work within the studio system, like Michael Curtis, you know, he was an incredible director and he would go direct things that he was picked to direct because they were on the slate and they had to be directed. I would argue that over time, these directors that might have been considered journeymen by the studio 
turned out to indeed be auteurs because of the way they staged scenes, the way they dealt with actors, the way they were attracted to certain material over and over and over again. So there are levels of auteurship. But when I'm thinking about auteurs, I am thinking about people like Quentin Tarantino. Stanley Kubrick is my favorite director, and he was either intimately involved in the writing of films or he was intimately involved with the people writing the films at his behest. So, and if you look at Kubrick's later work, much of it was adaptations of novels. And in the case of something like Lolita, he went and got Vladimir Nabokov, who wrote the novel, to write the film with him. You know, or Brian Aldiss, who wrote um, uh, Super Toys Last All Summer Long, which became the basis for AI that he was developing that Spielberg later directed. And so I think the great auteurs really do either write their films and direct them or direct films that they're intimately involved in the creation of the screenplays. But that doesn't mean that's the only kind of auteur. So that's an interesting thought. Now, modern directors, are they auteurs? The jury is still out on whether modern filmmakers fit the criteria of an auteur. Have a look at their profiles below. And here's a list of the profiles. Park Chan-wook, Guillermo del Toro, Nicholas Wending Refn, Christopher Nolan, Quentin Tarantino, Stanley Kubrick, Alejandro Jodorowsky, Michelangelo Antonioni, Mike Lee, Wes Anderson, John Carpenter, Wes Craven, Edgar Wright, Hayao Miyazaki, David Fincher, David Cronenberg, Michael Gondry, Terry Gilliam, Alfred Hitchcock, and Tim Burton. I would say yes, all of those filmmakers are auteurs. The auteur theory is used by critics to examine the creative process behind a work of art. For some filmmakers, having complete creative freedom over their projects is the principle of success. Some may see this as just another way of arguing that the filmmaker has too much input in the final product. They think directors should cooperate more with others, such as producers, editors, performers, etc. during production. Great auteurs, I think, are also great collaborators. Just a thought. Sometimes they're not. But the thing is, I don't think you would ever say that Martin Scorsese and Thelma Schoonmacher have not had a great relationship over the last few decades they've worked together. Thelma Schoonmacher has cut most of Scorsese's films, or Michael Kahn editing, say, Steven Spielberg. That's why great directors tend to work with the same people, because they believe in their collaborators, and their collaborators understand them. So it makes sense that they can create these things. The auteur theory is used by critics to examine the creative process. Some may see this as just another way of arguing that the filmmaker has too much input in the final product. They think directors should cooperate more with others. The auteur thesis is not a criticism of teamwork, but rather a benchmark for up-and-coming creatives to aim for. An argument could also be made that auteur status should be extended to creatives within other film roles, including but not limited to cinematographers, writers, editors, and costume designers with a distinct perspective. So that's just a brief overview of the auteur theory. Now, I would say this. When you're an auteur and then you hire a director of photography like Roger Deakins, you don't, as a good auteur, micromanage what Deakins is doing. You've hired Deakins for a reason. But part of, the, part of what being an auteur is is that you hired Deakins in the first place like when Sam Mendes hired Roger Deakins to shoot Skyfall. And before they even step on the stage or the set, they know what they want. They've discussed it. You know, they know exactly what's going on and what they're going to do to achieve that look. And then the thing is, while they're working together on the set, it is a very collaborative process, but a good auteur stays out of the way of his creative people. A good auteur or her or their guide these people into doing what they want them to do. But at the end of the day, it's the director who's got to call the shots. As I said, there is nothing more toxic or destructive on a film set when you have somebody undermining the authority of a director. It is terrible. There is not a worse thing you can do to a film crew. First of all, it makes everyone uncomfortable. And second of all, the film crew doesn't know what to listen to or who to, 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 to listen to. It's, it's a terrible way to make a movie. Terrible. And you hear, you hear stories about it happen. I mean, I recently... There, there was terrible stories about what happened to Neil Marshall, the great Neil Marshall on the set of the last Hellboy movie. He had to deal with a producer who stepped in and thought he was doing better. It, it never works. It never works. Anyway, so what about modern directors? What about Denis Villeneuve or Christopher Nolan working at the highest level with $100 million, $200 million? Is it possible to make an auteur movie while working for a studio with a bunch of studio money? Can you do that? Well, I would say, first of all, 
yes and yes, because studios, they all want the same 10 people. Like at any one time, there's 10 or 20 people on this planet that all the studios want to direct. They're, they don't want you know, an untried director, unless, of course, there is this weird school of thought that I don't understand. Like, we're going to surround this person with all these talented people, which makes sense. Like on a Marvel movie, you know, James Gunn's made two, three million dollar movies. Let's bring him up and have him write Guardians of the Galaxy. We want his sensibility. But, but the way Marvel makes movies is sort of akin to the way TV movies are made or TV shows are made where they have this apparatus in place and the director cycles through. However, if like James Gunn, you're going to co-write or write a script, you are then, you have a lot more leeway because it is your script that you're writing from. And as long as you work in collaboration with the studio and they know what you're doing, in this case, Kevin Feige or Louis Desposito or Victoria Alonso is no longer there, but however you're going to work, you're working in tandem. Now the studio, if you're doing that, you are checking in because the studio becomes another uh, another collaborator of yours. And there's nothing wrong with that. You just have to know how to do it. You know how to manage those those relationships. Directing a movie is as, as, as much child, uh, uh, not child, it's as much psychiatry, not just child psychiatry, although sometimes it is truly child psychiatry when you're trying to put the zap on somebody because we're all children in the entertainment business. But you want to make sure that you are collaborating with everybody. Um, they want to collaborate with you and they want to see you do good. That's the thing. Every all, Your crew, nobody wants you to succeed more than your crew does. So if you know how to utilize your crew, it is the most potent thing you have. And, and what is your secret weapon on the set for anybody who might direct? The first assistant director. Make no mistake. Any great production, the first assistant director is one of the key members, if not the key member of your team that's on set. Why? Your first AD is the conductor. He is going to make sure, like, you're the conductor of the orchestra, of course, but in terms of keeping the trains running on time, your first AD is your secret weapon. And as I like to say, uh, I haven't directed much in my life. I've only made one feature film and episodes of TV and a bunch of documentaries, but I'll tell you something. When you're on set, here's a little bit of advice coming from the Bobster. Make your first AD your best friend and make sure your first AD can, th can finish your thoughts. And what you want to do is what I like to do when I'm directing is I like to do what's called walking the day, which means you get to you get set early. Because remember, on a movie set, you're late if you show up on time. <laughs> get there early. Then you're on time. But the thing you should do with your first AD, for those of you who ever want to direct and you're working with a first AD, is walk the day. And you should take your cinematographer, too, where you as the director tell your first AD, here's what I'm doing, and take them through the entire day. You might be shooting five pages if it's a leisurely studio movie, or you might be shooting ten. However many pages you're going to shoot, you go through the script, and if you're on set, you walk around the set, and you go, I was thinking about shooting the scene this way. Your first AD hears this. Your DP hears this. They can talk to you about what you're going to do. You, you, They express their concerns or what they want to do. You as the director take them under advisement, but then you walk the entire day, not just the first part of the day, the entire day. That allows your first AD to understand where they got to go and how much time you have. And the first AD is going to keep you pushed to make sure you're going. And the director of photography knows how you want it shot. So the director of photography can tell his team to anticipate where your next camera move is going to be. So they can hang the lights and they're always ahead of the game. So you're not waiting on them. And that's true if you're a director of everybody on the set. But you have to walk the day. Always do it in the morning with your first AD and your director of photography, you will never, well, maybe not never, but you will alleviate many problems if you do that. Now, that doesn't mean you can't change your mind. But if you're going to change your mind, you keep that communication open with your first AD. Tell him or her, there's no one more valuable on a movie set for a director. I, I mean, you know, whether it's Glamdring or Excalibur, your first AD is the sword that you have. You're not actually wielding them, but you kind of are, figuratively. You want them on your side, and more importantly, you want them to believe in you. Because if they believe in you, they'll believe in you utterly. And if they believe in you, the crew believes in you. So make sure that happens. Anyway, let's talk about this article, which actually asks the question, 
And this one comes from Simon Dillon, and it was published in Fanfare, which is a segment or a section of Medium, medium medium.com. Simon Dillon wrote this four days ago. It was published. And um, let's jump in and see if um, see if we agree with what uh, Simon has to say in this article. Uh, it's called "Are Directors the Sole Author of a Film?" In view of recent conversations around why a film can be nominated for Best Picture without also nominating the director, I've had a lot of people asking my position on the so-called auteur theory. For those unfamiliar with it, in massively reductionist terms, auteur theory claims because the director is in creative control of a film, they are, in effect, the sole author of that film. The idea originated in the 1940s with U.S. film critic Andre Serres building on ideas from French French film theorists Andre Bazin and Alexander Astruc. Auteur theory generated much excitement and much excited discussion in the pages of Cahiers du Cinema in the 50s, including contributions from Jean-Luc Godard and Francois Truffaut. Frankly, I've always considered auteur theory absurd. It's like saying record producer George Martin is the sole author of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Having said that, it's clear some directors leave their unique stamp or signature on films in far greater ways than others. What is the difference between directors that do and directors that don't? Should a director that doesn't be considered should a director that doesn't be considered a lesser beast? And how does that inform the way some films are nominated for best picture rather than best director in award ceremonies? Taking those questions one by one, let's start with the difference between directors. You don't need to be a cineaste steeped in film lore to spot the common directorial stamp on Edward Scissorhands and Batman Returns, both being directed with the gothic visual sensibilities of Tim Burton and sharing many of his common themes. On the other hand, you'd have to be psychic to guess Robert Wise directed both The Haunting and The Sound of Music and Star Trek The Motion Picture, as they hardly share directorial flourishes or thematic similarities. Directors with an identifiable visual and thematic style include the likes of Akira Kurosawa, Igmar Bergman, David Lean, Agnes Varda, Orson Welles, John Ford, Woody Allen, Stanley Kubrick, David Lynch, Spike Lee, Sofia Coppola, Jordan Peele, Celine Sciamma, and Christopher Nolan. Directors who didn't necessarily set out to make personal statements with a signature visual style but went from project to project, sometimes tremendous projects, include the aforementioned Wise, plus directors like Michael Curtiz, Terrence Fisher, Robert Stevenson, Terrence Young, Robert Hammer, Richard Donner, Jonathan Demme, Martin Campbell, James Mangold, and Ron Howard. The presence of an auteur director doesn't necessarily mean you'll get a great film. As I mentioned earlier, Jean-Luc Godard was considered an auteur, but much of his later work is insufferable nonsense. (laughs) The woeful film Socialism, or for instance, only the most pretentious of film snobs would consider film socialism of greater worth than, say, Mary Poppins, an iconic classic directed by the unassuming Robert Stevenson. At the same time, it's absurd to state that Stevenson is the sole author of Mary Poppins. It's based on books written by P.L. Travers and adapted by Walt Disney, featuring a screenplay by Bill Walsh and Don uh, DeGrati with earworm songs from the Sherman Brothers, a definitive central performance from Julie Andrews, a great supporting cast, despite Dick Van Dyke's lamentable Cockney accent, and so forth. You get the idea. What about a film that's not carefully packaged studio product, albeit one as pitch perfect as Mary Poppins? Pitch perfect in every way. What about a film by an auteur revered by cineasts? Let's take Orson Welles' Citizen Kane as an example. Again, while Wells indeed had creative control, he was working from a first-rate screenplay co-written with Herman Mankiewicz. Do we disregard the other great contributions to the look and feel of the film? Greg Tolan's groundbreaking deep focus cinematography, for instance? Or Bernard Herrmann's score? Do we just ignore that and say Wells did all the work? Wells deserves considerable credit, no doubt. I don't wish to diminish the director, but the idea that the director alone is the author of a film is only possible to the degree that the director does all the jobs himself. In almost all cases, that isn't physically possible. 
Yes, the director oversees departments, approving sets, costumes, casting choices, screenplay revisions, camera angles, visual style, and so on, but they aren't the ones necessarily coming up with these concepts. Rather, they give parameters and approve the results. Now, I want to step in here and say that would be like saying that a composer, I mean, pardon me, a conductor of an orchestra does not contribute. He didn't write the music. He's not playing the, the, the instruments. And yet, when you see Leonard Bernstein conduct Beethoven's 7th, I suggest you go watch it, maybe not now, but it's amazing. Bernstein's 7th might be different than George Schulte's 7th. You know, some people would say that George Schulte recorded the definitive version of the uh, Wagner's Ring Cycle, the Ring of the Nibelung, back in 1963. Is that true? I don't know, but I've probably heard the Schulte version of the Ring of the Nibelung more than any other version of the Ring, which I heard a lot because we played it at the store I worked at in the 80s called Silver Platters. But anyway, I would say that a conductor conducts the orchestra in their inimitable style. When you watch an orchestra conducted by Lydia Tarr, you know it's Lydia Tarr. I know. She's not real. And she didn't show up in Maestro, so I know she's not real. But you know what? In my mind, she is. You go, Lydia Tarr. I don't care if you're now making music for video games. It's still amazing. You were railroaded, and it sucks. You shouldn't have just done that thing at the live performance in front of everybody, though. I'm sorry. But anyway, the whole point is that you can have all the greatest people in the world, but if you don't have a great director that knows what to do with all those talented people and you ask somebody to take it back home, hey, if you don't have a good director, who's going to tell the crew how to shoot two people at a restaurant sitting at a table? How do they know what to do? How many setups are we going to have? Because at the end of the day, what you see, sure, is the results of tons of people, but all filtered through the sensibilities of one. I mean, rightly or wrongly, studios probably, you know, it's always funny. People are like, well, the studios want somebody that they can control. And I'm like, well, who at the studio knows how to make a movie? I mean, maybe Kevin Feige knows how to make a movie because remember, he produced 14 Marvel movies before he even started on the MCU. And he, in a producerial capacity, he saw what worked and what didn't work. I'm surprised he hasn't directed a movie already, but Kevin Feige must be coming in if you include the Marvel TV shows and the 14 films. He's has to, he has to be closing in on 60, 60 Marvel projects that he's produced. 60. He probably knows more about Marvel, making Marvel, Marvel movies than just about anybody. He's never directed, though, which is interesting. I wonder why. However, I would say that the Marvel movies work more like a TV show. For a TV show, a director comes in, directs the, the show, gets to do a first cut, delivers what that vision of the show was, and then the producers come in, the showrunner, the creator, and they do whatever they want because they're the final say. A TV director just gets everything in the can while the creators and the producers and the showrunners, they're editing episodes, they're writing episodes, they're keeping that machine running. The director comes and goes on a TV show, but not on a movie. I believe in the auteur theory. I've been on many sets. And once you've, it's easy for people that have never made a movie to make the point that this author just made. And it's easy for screenwriters to make this point too. But until you've been in that position and you can actually see or understand just how many decisions have to be filtered through the director... Uh, it's a little difficult to understand. But anyway, would Jaws, this, this, um, let, let me, um, Wells deserves considerable credit, no doubt. I don't wish to diminish the director, but the idea that the director alone is the author of a film is only possible to the degree that the director does all the jobs himself. In almost all cases, that isn't physically possible. Yes, the director oversees departments, approving sets, costumes, casting choices, screenplay revisions, camera angles, visual style, and so on, but they aren't the only ones necessarily coming up with these concepts. Rather, they give parameters and approve the results. Would Jaws be the film it is without the John Williams score? Of course not. Steven Spielberg didn't come up with the two-note classic theme. Williams did. In fact, Spielberg's first reaction was to laugh when Williams suggested it. But Williams knew what he was doing and talked Spielberg around. 
Yes, Spielberg belongs in the former category of filmmakers with a signature style and themes, and yes, he has creative control over his various departments with Final Cut Privilege, another important subject I'll come to in a moment, but he isn't the sole author, nor I think would he claim to be. No, I think the great directors understand they're collaborative, but it was Steven Spielberg who said yes to the dun -dun theme. He had to know. There are some people that might not have known, and they might have told John Williams not to go with it. Spielberg knew. Now, while he didn't write the music, he knew what music to use when he heard it, even though he might not have known it at first. John Williams also made a big difference to Star Wars. But the great unsung hero here is editor Marsha Lucas. By all accounts, she radically overhauled the film from the initial cut, which largely played out in scenes and master shots, into the pacey adventure romp that influenced blockbuster filmmaking for better or worse around the world. George Lucas is a visionary, no question, but the success of Star Wars not. I don't consider George Lucas an auteur necessarily. He's more of a journeyman director, especially because when they were making, well, Star Wars and especially the prequels, uh, so much of it was done in a very sort of a different way. But I would say this, George Lucas came up with those ideas and those concepts on his own. And while he had great collaborators, and he might not necessarily be so so great with interacting with human beings, he did originate the story, and all of his concepts, he, he came up with all them, and the overarching idea of what the story was going to be. So while he might not be the great visionary director, and he might, might have been borrowing his signature style from Kurosawa or wherever, he was still the auteur behind Star Wars. Six Star Wars movies. Actually, he only directed four, but the other two, obviously other people directed. I would say the only the only movie that didn't really have George Lucas's imprintur on it as a director is Empire Strikes Back, because he wasn't there when Irvin Kershner directed the majority of that film. So anyway, by necessity, filmmaking is a collaborative endeavor. Often great auteur directors use the same heads of departments, which prop perhaps explains the unique stamp on the films in question. Returning to Steven Spielberg these days, he almost always uses the same cinematographer, Janusz Kaminski, with whom he first worked with on Schindler's List in 1993. Michael Kahn has been the editor of almost all of his films. John Williams has composed music for almost all of his films. The same was true with Alfred Hitchcock, who, struck with largely, who stuck with largely the same crew. In mainstream Hollywood, is the director's cut always the best cut? In mainstream Hollywood, at least, final cut is a privilege generally earned after paying one's dues in the industry. Yet even successful directors considered auteurs can need a good producer to take control. A famous example is found in The Godfather when Robert Evans rejected Francis Ford Coppola's initial cut and ordered the picture re-edited. Considering Coppola's first version ran over just two hours, perhaps partly due to the studio pressure for a shorter running time, yes it was, I'd say Evans was right to reinstate the extra material, resulting in the 175-minute cut we know and love today. But he did that because that's what the studio initially wanted. It was then Robert Evans who said, no, 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 put back the movie we made. No film is perfect, but The Godfather is as close to perfection as it's possible to get. I agree. I wouldn't touch a frame of it, and for that, we have Evans to thank. That doesn't diminish Coppola as a director in any way. He brought authenticity and stunning attention to detail to The Godfather. He made great, out, uh, he made great art out of Mario Puzo's pulpy source material and coaxed an arguably career-best performance from Al Pacino. But Coppola's judgment was evidently in question in the edit suite, considering Evans described that first cut as a long, bad trailer for a really good film. That is true, but that's because what Coppola thought that's what he had to do. Remember, he shot it all. It was all there. They didn't go reshoot a bunch of stuff. Of course, there are other examples one can cite when short-sighted studio interference vandalized a film in the edit suite. Blade Runner is a good example. But my point is simple. It isn't automatically the case that a producer is wrong. Well, that's where collaboration comes in. A great auteur director knows who to listen to and when to listen to them. Film is very iterative. People say that great art is never finished, only abandoned. That's pretty much true of a movie. But I would say this. I have a theory about this, another observation, if you want to call it, that I think that there is a place that a movie gets to where it's going to be the best it can possibly be. Now, I would say you always think to yourself, you know what, this can be better, this can be better, this can be better, until you do reach a point 
where it's the best it's ever going to be, no matter what you – and usually it's not just you who think that. Uh, I found in my uh, career as an editor, mostly on low-budget features, when you're editing, and I really love sitting there with the director because I've only worked in low-budget, so I've only ever worked with the director directly um, – you get to a point where, and I'm the one usually pushing to say, "Hey, let's 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 do more. We can make this better." And my th- my my way of working is, I don't stop editing until I cut out everything I hate that's in a movie, whether it's a bad line reading or whether it's a scene I don't like or whatever. And I don't stop until that is um, that until we're done. So um, then I'm then I'm satisfied. Once everything that I hate's gone, hey. Uh, <clears throat> where does this leave the argument that an Oscar nomination for Best Picture ought to automatically mean a nomination for Best Director? I've discussed discussed this issue elsewhere in relation to the recent kerfluffle over Greta Gerwig not getting nominated for Barbie. However, I will reiterate here that the award for Best Picture is for producers, for those with overall responsibility for the entire production, including the choice of director. Of course, sometimes the director and producer are one and the same, but directing and producing are two different jobs. I want to point out Ben Affleck, who directed Argo, and he wasn't even nominated for Best Picture Directing, and that movie won Best Picture. The Best Director Award is primarily about the confidence, clarity, and innovation with which the story is told visually. Best Picture takes into consideration every aspect of a production and is therefore for voted on points, so to speak. As I've said before, it is possible for a film to score highly in performances, costume design, production design, music score, editing, cinematography, and so forth, but for other films to have more confident or innovative direction. Hence, why some directors get shut out even though their film is nominated for Best Picture. Furthermore, as I've explained in this article, although some films are more dominated by directors than others, regardless of how much input directors have with their heads of departments, even the most auteur-heavy films rely on collaboration and ideas that come from outside the director, 100%. As such, a director can almost never claim to be the sole author. I say this almost never because one exception just occurred to me. The lovely animated feature, Away. Since Latvian filmmaker Gintz, oh my god, Zilbalotis, really did do everything himself. In this particular case, he can be considered an auteur. So, as we are on the weekend before the Academy Awards, I figured we'd delve into that subject because people always ask me about it. I believe that a director is the auteur uh, behind a movie. Now... There are different levels of that. There are very much journeyman directors who don't necessarily bring a lot to the film. You know, they... Well, here's the funny thing. Another theory I have about directing. Um, Film, cinema, is supposed to show you the world in a way that you can't see it yourself. Now, I don't just mean taking you to the surface of Arrakis or to Middle Earth and show you... Such or being like the Cenobites who have such sights to show you. I don't mean that, but I mean it's like presenting a conversation at a table at a restaurant. We human beings basically see in the equivalent, I mean, it's not quite like this, but we basically see with a fixed focal length, our eyes, basically a 50 millimeter lens. That's the only way we can see the world. We're locked into looking at it that way, unless you're looking through binoculars or you're wearing glasses or something. But for the most part, that's how we see the world. What cinema does is it immediately shows us the world differently than we can see it ourselves. And that's something that's interesting to me right away. We can't suddenly snap, like if you see a picture of a human being, like there's a photograph, there's a girl I used to um, date. Uh, I was in high school, and her name's Kelly, and I have a picture of her. I still have it somewhere, and there was a picture of her. It was an incredibly beautiful picture of her, and it was a very, it was a candid picture of her just sitting in a restaurant, and she's kind of just crooking her head, smiling with her, and it was a picture that I could never see in real life because of the angle that was used, because of the lens that was used on the camera, so it presented her to me in a way that I personally could never see her. 
I could see something similar, but not that exact picture because I don't see in that with that lens. But I always loved that picture of her because it was different than any time I could ever see in real life. So when you sit down at a restaurant and you take a photograph or you shoot a scene, when you do a close-up like this and you get close into someone's face, when we are watching that, we're seeing a, some, we're seeing a human being's face unless you're like right up to them, you know, you're making love to somebody and you're stroking their cheek and kissing them and looking into their eyes. You can't even, you get too close to somebody, you can't see them anymore either. So what cinema does is it shows you the world in a way you cannot see it yourself. And that's one of the things I think is amazing about movies. And it can take the mundane and show you the most ordinary of circumstances. But if it's shot in such a way, if you have an auteurist vision, you see the mundane in an entirely different way. Somebody said they don't really like Terrence Malick's Tree of Life in the comments section down below a couple weeks, no, a couple days ago. And I would say one of the things about Tree of Life is it shows you the wonder in the mundane. One of my favorite films of all time, Jean-Pierre Genet's Amelie, takes the everyday and makes it magical. Not just the way it's shot, not just the effects work, not just the color palette, but also the soul of that movie. Very auteur-driven. And everything that's happening in that movie is coming out of the imagination of Genet. He's employing his incredible team to help him create that. But that's an auteur's vision if ever I saw one. And um, I don't think anyone would take that away from him. So the real question is, what do you guys think? Do you think it's possible? Do you think auteurs are genuinely auteurs? Um, I know a lot of the screenwriters out there wouldn't agree. But what do you guys think? How do you feel about it? Uh, Put your questions and comments and observations down below in the comments of this show. Um, Let's see. uh, um, Darth Plato says, Rob, your shirt kicks ass. Thank you. This is my Los Angeles Maximus Decimus Meridius shirt. <laughs> L.A., I guess it's it's Vegas now. Uh, but thank you for noticing. By the way, volume is my volume. Oh, you know what? Did, did my volume of the show go down? Damn it. Did I scream into the, into the microphone? Probably. I apologize uh, if I did that. Um, yeah, my volume went down. Okay. I'm bringing it back up. Sometimes it happens. I don't know why. Sometimes I say something and it just, well, I hope it's okay. You know what I'll do? Well, I can't. It's too late now. Um, I apologize, but I wish I'd seen that before. Um, Joseph Michael says, I was pleasantly surprised by how well Dune Part 2, which was shot in 4K on the Arri Alexa LF cameras, holds up on 70mm IMAX. I would have never thought it wasn't shot on film. Well, that's because they put it through an elaborate post process to make you think it was shot on film. And uh, I would suggest looking into that. Greg Frazier uh, has a lot of really interesting things to say about um, about how he shot it and then the post process of shooting it digitally and then converting it into uh, uh, like a negative. It's, it's fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Um. Darth Plato comes back and says, Hey, Rob, if you could take any Bond movie and turn it into a musical, which movie would it be and why? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Um, Probably Honor Majesty's Secret Service because it's a romance and then you have a bunch of girl uh, delivery systems for this virus and Telly Savalas is Blofeld and uh, and his henchwoman uh, would be very interesting to see in a musical number. And there's skiing, so you could have ice skating, and you could have all different kinds of things. You've got a dominating father, um, uh, and uh, Teresa's father's, I mean, the possibilities are endless. So, yeah. Joey Johnson says, happy birthday, my man. (laughs) I can't believe a day went by so fast. P.S. I've been wondering for months why you don't approve of the movie version of Rent. You know what? I've seen Rent on the stage, and I saw it. It's the same thing. Um, I remember seeing a chorus line. I saw a chorus line on on the stage, and and then I saw the movie. And there was something about both. I just don't think they worked as effectively uh, as they did on stage. Maybe it has something to do with the 
the um, you know the milieu because then with rent you have to then obviously go shoot it on the streets of New York and maybe I I just I didn't dig it as much I just didn't think it worked as well as it did as a stage production and you know um, I, I that's all I can say I mean I really I really um, I really don't know I mean that's that's um, that's all I can say that's all I can really think about. Um, I just don't think they worked as well. Uh, so Tom Jr. Jackson says, Rob, the chat is saying your mic volume is low. Well, I apologize for that. Hopefully it's alleviated itself after an hour. <laughs> I hope you can just crank up the volume, pump up the volume, pump up the volume, pump up the volume, dance, dance. Do, 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 do. So I apologize for that. Uh, Mario Lopez says, do you think Dune 2 will be the empire of our youth? I do not. I do not. Um, only because the world is a different place and, uh, the expectations. The thing about Dune is Dune is based on a property that was published in 1965. It's been adapted. This is the third time it's been adapted. It's, it's existed in the cultural zeitgeist, I think. And I also think the way that Dune 2 is, and Dune, Dune 1 and 2 are more like European art films. They work in our brains in a very different way than, the Star Wars movies worked. Um, and so I don't think, especially for kids, I mean, maybe some kids are going to love Dune 1 and 2, but I don't think children, because when I saw Star Wars for the first time, I was 10. It changed my life. I would certainly not have loved Dune as much if I saw it for the first time when I was 10. I just, I wouldn't have. And I, I, I think that most people think differently. And also, Dune is definitely more, I mean, a thinking person's movie. The messianic impulse would probably be lost on many 10-year-olds or younger. So I don't think, while I think I think Dune is a staggering achievement, I don't think it has nearly the... And first of all, what I find really interesting about Dune, this is my favorite thing, and I knew this was happening. It happened with the first film. There's a lot of people who are perplexed by those people that think Dune 2 is so revelatory because... It is more of a European art film. It 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 isn't your typical plot driven. People are talking to each other, and we really understand what's happening. Um, it definitely has a certain sensibility in mind, and it's a lot less accessible to people than, say, Star Wars or Lord of the Rings are, um, which are much more traditional. I would call them entertainments, but. Um, if you're more contemplative and you can appreciate what's going on, because I've already talked to a lot of film fans that have, have contacted me um, and they prefer, let's call it more traditional genre entertainment. And um, it's like the difference for me, like I love Star Trek, the motion picture. Very few people love Star Trek, the motion picture more than they love Star Trek to the wrath of Khan, which I understand, but um, it's, it's a different vibe. Star Trek to the wrath of Khan is a lot more fun. It's a lot more what I would call a traditional entertainment, where Star Trek The Motion Picture is more contemplative. It's more of a Dune thing, not because of the great spectacle. Although, you know, if Denis Villeneuve had directed Star Trek The Motion Picture, it would have been really interesting, uh, I think. But, you know, would it have been as resonant? I don't know. Because Denis Villeneuve has said he's not particularly interested in people talking to each other. So the points that I think the movie is trying to make are much more sort of they're not delivered in the traditional way so i don't think that dune 2 could ever be considered i mean people are always going to equate it to that but i would say that dune 2 is a phenomenal i mean they're they're two sides of the they're there you need both parts of the story i do love the fact i think a lot of people are misinterpreting the way the movie ends i think dune 1 and dune 2 end and begin and end in a very nice book ended status and i think that um while it, you know, people are misinterpreting the the, the changes, the, the 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 primary changes, and I've been saying this that were made to Dune, is that one, the Fremen. I mean, in terms of plots like Thufir Howard and things like that, are, are are the adaptation excises things. But in terms of changing significantly what Herbert had in the book, the Fremen do not all believe the same things. The prophecy has taken hold. There are fundamentalist Fremen, and there are more reform Fremen. And that's a that's a change. And Cheney, uh, Zendaya's character in the book was much more supportive of Paul. In this, 
She already loved him, and she's seeing him go down a path that she doesn't agree with. She's not a fundamentalist, you know, and she's watching this man she loves like she thinks he's buying into this bullshit, you know, the prophecy. And it's not that she doesn't believe in the prophecy, but she doesn't, I don't think she believes that Paul, you know, Moadib is, is this messianic figure everyone makes him out to be. And I think she's really perplexed by that. And she has to put up with that. And the thing is, it makes sense. I mean, it's different than the book. And like Andre, who I adore from Midnight's Edge, said she's much more like a girl boss and she kind of leaves in a huff. But the way it's set up is Paul does not talk to her about what he's going to do during his little revolution and tells her something and then turns around and does something that really hurt her. And in the book, if you read the ending of the book, as a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, I can. Let's see if I can find it. I can actually read uh, how the book ends to you. Um, if I can find it, we'll see if I can. Um, I don't know. I have it here somewhere, but it's not. It just says screen grab. So um, let's see if I can uh, if I can find it. Uh, and so it's not so difficult to see. Um, maybe I can't find it. Maybe it's too difficult for me to find. Yeah, I guess I can't. Maybe I can't uh, can't get to it. But uh, let me see. Um, no, it'd be too too hard for me to see it. So it was a, it was a good idea. But if you read it, basically the gist is that um, Jessica tells Cheney and says, "Look, right now you might think of yourself as a concubine, but the history books will write us as the wives, just like Jessica was." Duke Leto's uh, concubine, but but in this film, you know she's pissed. She doesn't resolve herself. She's not because she also doesn't understand. She she says to Paul, you know, your aristocracy, you're all this. She's not used to all that. She doesn't know what all that is. So when she leaves in a huff, it doesn't mean she's not going to support him. She's going to come back because what happens in Dune Messiah, you know, um, and and in the book something else that was missing it'll probably be dealt with in the in the in the next movie is that they have a child Cheney and and Paul have a child who dies then they have twins but they have a child who dies that was supposed to happen in Dune they've clearly pushed that later um but anyway um Mikey Lito hello Mikey Mikey said I would point out that Hitchcock's wife Alma uh Reville was a frequent contributor to his films I'm fairly certain he had some input. Yeah, she was. And he ran all those things by her. Um they didn't they didn't have sex though. He was celibate for the better part of their marriage. <laughs> I don't know why I know that. Only because I've done a lot of work on Hitchcock myself. Um, not that kind of work. Mikey says, after spending the week diving into Villeneuve's English language films, I'm very much looking forward to investigating his French language films. Uh, you gotta see Incindies. Incindies is a banger. And um you got to check that out. Very much worth seeing. Very interesting. I'll be curious to hear what you think of it. Jason Webster says, when talking about international directors, my favorites are Akira Kurosawa, Park Chan-wook, and Ozu. Those are great directors. I would consider them all auteurs. Uh, very much so. Um, Joey Johnson says, do you consider Hayao Miyazaki an auteur? I absolutely do. I mean, Miyazaki movies, he might have a bunch of animators working on them, but I absolutely consider him an auteur, 100%. 1001 Johnny says, I finally saw Dune Part 2 last night in 4D. It was an awesome conclusion to the conflict started in the first film. I really love the film itself. The 4D was not for me. I dare say it was atrocious. That is, I found it invasive upon my viewing of the film. Yeah, I don't like those. I don't like those things. Um, I don't. Claudius says, how are you doing, man? Uh, I believe the core fan base of popular source material are more interested in faithful adaptations of character and storylines than in an auteur's unique vision. Bernstein's responsibility was to deliver the, be to deliver the best version of the fifth, not the disco version. I agree with that, but, I mean, when it comes to classical music, pacing is a big issue. And I'll tell you something, the, the rhythm, I think Bernstein really understood, like I love Beethoven's seventh, the, the, uh, 
was it? No, I want to say affogato, but that's not affogato. Um, the but I love b- the the seventh, and um, you can hear that performed many different ways. He nailed the pace of that piece, and um, it's 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 not an easy thing to do. And his is different than other people's. But I agree with you. the The problem is translating something from one medium into another. By definition, it has to be adaptation. And look, I'll tell you this. When I saw, I read, the only Harry Potter book I read was the first one, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. And then when I saw Sorcerer's Stone, the movie version, I thought, as I watched it, I thought it was a movie about magic that was less than magical, if that made any sense. Um, I thought the movie was kind of slavishly devoted to the text to the point where I think it needed more adaptation. I think Zack Snyder's version of Watchmen, I love the Watchmen comic. I, I think it's more of a recreation rather than an adaptation, even though the ending's different. I think you have to adapt things. I mean, I think that part of the reason, like Frank Herbert gave the Fremen the fundamentalist, I mean, uh, uh, Denis Villeneuve, he changed uh, Frank Herbert's, the, the Fremen were all of one mind, and it, Denis Villeneuve made them, uh, there's a fundamentalist faction. I think that made the story richer because when the Islamic world has changed so much since when Herbert was inspired by the Islamic world to write the Dune future, um, there wasn't the Islamic revolution in Iran. There, there, the, 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 uh, the Islamic world was a little less, um, I mean, it, there was still a lot of people that were screaming for the world caliphate and Sharia law and all that, but there were places that were a lot more Uh, loose in terms of the belief systems and now they've become much more fundamentalist and i think they were playing into that and i thought that was interesting i thought i I really like that change i know people purists like well wait a minute and i'm like well you know you you move with the times it's not like dune is the easiest book in the world to read no one's gonna ever accuse frank herbert's prose of being like the most deliciously readable prose you've ever read in your life (laughs) because it's not um jay angel Became a new member of the channel. Uh, Hidden Trail Pictures is a PGS hero and has been for 19 months. And Mo Sislak, Sislak, I think, sorry, gifted memberships. Gift, gifted five memberships to the channel. Mo, thank you. Uh, Sislak, is that how you pronounce it? Sislak? I hope I didn't mask your name, but thank you for gifting people memberships. Next week, we have another member call. And as I said, I'm going to be putting up beforehand so you can hear the uh the proof of concept for the audio drama that we're doing mark specter's avatar said may thy knife chip and shatter what can i do what can i put how about this how about a wine opener (laughs) i don't have a knife um but there you go um dan candy says rob you have strength you shall be known as usul which is the strength of the base of the pillar this is your secret name in our chat, but you must choose the name of manhood, which we will call you openly on YouTube. I don't know my, uh, uh, I, well, I just, you know, my nicknames, <laughs> Viceroy. No, I don't know. That sounds too pretentious and stupid. Uh, you know what? All the nicknames I have were hung on me by others. I will leave it to the chat and the members and Anybody else who watches this, you tell me how you're going to call me or what my name is on YouTube. Um, Shellcrow says, on the cusp of the Oscars, what are your votes? Oppenheimer, best picture. Christopher Nolan, best director. Robert Downey Jr., best supporting actor. Killian Murphy, best actor. I know Paul Giamatti was great. Um, Best actress. Uh, Divine is going to win for holdovers for best supporting. You know what? I'd give it to Emma Stone, best actress. I don't think she's going to win, but I'd give it to her. I I, I would. Um, uh, Joey Johnson says, follow up. I saw the final performance of Rent and I agree with you. Yeah, it's, it's a stage. It's, it's a great, it's a great stage play. Uh, I don't know what else, you know, what else am I supposed to, I really hope Godzilla minus one wins best visual effects. How, what a banger that would be. It'd be so great. Um, I think that Oppenheimer is going to win best adapted screenplay. Um, 
man, I don't know. I'd have to see a list in front of me, but those are those are the ones like off the top of my head. Uh, 1001 Johnny says, Rob, I think the difference you keep talking about that Dune isn't a traditional crowd pleaser. It's because Dune is as a whole a tragedy and the film crowd haven't learned to consume the catharsis of good tragedy. Yeah, you know, and I'll tell you something. I think they set Cheney up at the end of the movie to be a tragic figure. Much more tragic. I mean, she's a tragic figure in Dune Messiah, but much more tragic in that of all the characters in Dune, I mean, a lot of people get fucked. The Atreides get fucked, but she gets fucked royally because everything she believed about her existence on Arrakis and her people swept away. And the man she loves did it. And, you know, the, it's, it's, it's sad because, you know, these forces, these gigantic forces that the every person can't hope to do anything about, they're at the mercy of these, the great tidal forces of history, and there's nothing she can do about it. And it's kind of sad. And I like that addition to the movie. Uh, Kenneth the Acadian says... Chani is the audience perspective. Hard disagree with Andre. This update is great. I agree. I think you're absolutely right. But I can understand Andre's reaction to that because if you're a fundamentalist in terms of what you think about the books, but I don't think, I, I mean, we're all so used to looking at that whole, well, is it the MCU or is it the, but in this particular case, remember Dune 1 opened with her voiceover and closing Dune Part 2 with her after what happens to her, it's, it's, she is the audience proxy. And we are seeing this beautiful existence, even though the Harkonnens were destroying her people and it was horrible. And she told you about it. She still believed in her own people and what she lost is her own people. You know, you get rid of one invader and somebody else comes in that you, you think you love and is going to be great for you and your people. And, and, in a way, it was far worse. I mean, the Harkonnens, at least you could understand, they were being hunted down and destroyed. But Paul changed them. The Benny Gesserit bullshit prophecy changed them. And um, it's a bummer. <laughs> Claudius says, I wasn't laughing at you, Kenneth. <laughs> Claudius says, let's compare Kubrick's The Shining adaptation to Walter Murphy's Disco, A Fifth of Beethoven. The author... And many fans did not approve of those distinctive approaches. Kubrick's The Shining was not well reviewed, but both distinctive approaches won new fans. Well, I would say, yeah, I would say that, but 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 in in the they weren't trying to be something like Kubrick was not saying he did a very Stanley Kubrickian adaptation of King's work. He was not trying to have a slavish devotion. I would say this: if you're doing a stage play. You don't get to change the text. I mean, you you can, but if you're adapting like a David Mamet play or something, you don't change the text. You have to go to David Mamet and you have to say, can we change the text? Whereas an adaptation of a book can be different uh, if you want it to be. And a fifth of Beethoven taking a classical piece of music or what Wendy Carlos did or Walter Carlos at the time, but when what Wendy Carlos did for Clockwork Orange in adapting Beethoven's Ninth, to making it electronic or switched on Bach, you know, those things were taking a different medium and translating the music, but it was still recognizable. Whereas I would say the a fifth of Beethoven is probably more recognizable to people than, um, the shining was because I think, I think Kubrick fundamentally changed the focus of the story that Stephen King was telling. So, Whereas I don't think that Walter Murphy was fundamentally changing. He was just reinterpreting it in a new way as opposed to adapting it to be something else, if that makes any sense. Maybe I won't believe that tomorrow. Thomas Logan says, Dune Messiah opens with Paul Atreides looking right at the camera and saying, no ticky, no laundry. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think. Can you imagine what what uh, the laundry that they would? I mean, where do you where do you wash your clothes on Arrakis? Do you use that? You can't use that siege water. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> um, but that's funny. Scott Bartholomew says watching game changing and generationally defined movies like Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back as a thirteen year old left an indelible mark. As an adult, works like these have evolved to something different. 
Yeah, I mean, I would say that, honestly, I would say that video games have supplanted, I mean, maybe movies can work in the same way, but if I was a 13-year-old kid today, uh, or a ten-year-old kid, it, it's video games that ha- have more, would have more meaning and resonance. People, I, I mean, I hate to say it, movies were the art form of the twentieth century. They are going to be phased out in the twenty-first because entertainment's changing. And really, you know, a hundred years was a good run for movies, but you know, we'll see. I don't think drama is entirely going to go away. But I think with interactivity and gaming. It's going to be less passive and people are going to be more more involved. I mean, because uh, playing games is a more it's a, it's a more experiential activity for no other reason than like, you know, when you're playing The Last of Us, you're involved. I felt this way when I first played Uncharted back in the when it first came out, I want to say in 20, 2007, I think, 2007, 2008, when the first Uncharted came out, maybe. And it was the first time I was so immersed in the story of the game. I liked the gameplay as well, but the graphics were incredible. The characters were incredible. I felt this is the first time I was as, as absorbed in the storyline and the gameplay as I was in a movie. That was the very first time I ever felt that way. It was when I played the first Uncharted. And I was like, this is the future. So we shall we shall see. Um uh, Mario Lopez says, the only thing I hated in Dune 2 was the popcorn ritual. <laughs> That's very funny. Um, that is very amusing, Mario. Uh, very amusing. Let me uh, catch up with, see what I'm missing here. Um, <laughs> the popcorn ritual. That's very funny. Uh, Denis Villeneuve <laughs> says, Dune Part 2 on two grams of mushrooms and IMAX was insane. <laughs> well, Denis, you did it to all of us. Well done. <laughs> um, let's see. I just want to make uh, make sure I don't miss anything. So, uh, by the way, Dan Candy, he, he did throw in 20 to ask me what to call me openly on YouTube. And I feel like because that's a nice, generous tip that I need to come up with an answer, I can't just throw it on to you. So, again, I don't know. Um. Uh, uh, probably, uh, it, it, I mean, you know, Moad, Moadib, you know, I, I don't know what that, I, something cool, like, I mean, that's mouse. Um, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know what I would call myself. I have to, I have to think about that. I like it better though. When people, um, come up with names for me, <laughs> it's better. Um, it works better for me, <laughs> I think. Um, Okay, I think I've caught up with what everybody was saying. Um, but yeah, Joseph Michael also sent in a $20 tip, and I would say there's really interesting. I did an interesting interview with Greg Frazier uh, for Designing Hollywood, the director of photography for Dune. And it's really, the process is very, very uh, interesting in terms of what they did to make the movie. Um, well, listen, everybody. I think I'm going to call this a night. I'm sorry the volume was low. I apologize for that. Um, sometimes that happens. Uh, RRTNZ says, I saw Dune 2 when Paul cried, I am Iron Man, and used quantum torpedoes to destroy Skull and save Robin from Boba Fett and the Cylons. I wept. Yeah, but what was, what was Chuck Norris doing? That's what I want to know. Uh, I think I'm going to end this chat. I want to thank everybody for hanging out and uh, listening to me prattle on. What do you guys think about the auteur theory? Who are your favorite auteurs? Who do you think is an auteur or is called an auteur that shouldn't be an auteur? Is there anybody? Uh, Put put, put what you think down in uh, in the chat. And on that note, I'll be back tomorrow with Mr. Dieter Bastian. We're starting at 10 a.m. because I'm going on George the Giant Slayer. We are bringing on... Bill Hunt at noon to talk about the Disney Sony physical media situation. And um, yeah. And on that note, I want to thank Tom Jr. Jackson for being a great moderator and for just being an all around good goof person. So, and I want to thank all of you for generously supporting this channel via super chats and tips and all that and memberships next week. We'll have another member chat uh, obviously I'm doing more raw observations, uh, by popular demand. As long as I can figure out interesting things to talk about, I'll keep 
coming back. Um, yeah. And remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I would say to all of you, have a better day and the spice must flow. <laughs>